Hello, my name is Arnico Pande. I'm an atmospheric scientist by training, but I've been working across a range of interconnected fields from climate change to air pollution uh, to various solutions to the problems, uh, mitigation adaptation options, as well as impacts. As you might be aware, the world's largest storage of frozen water is in Antarctica and the Arctic, but the third largest is in the in the high mountain Asia region, that's the Hindukush Himalaya region, extending along the western and the northern edges of the Tibetan Plateau through the Kunlun Mountains, the Tian Shan Mountains, the Pamir Mountains, and then on the east the Hengduan. This whole region has the the only mountain ranges in the world of more than seven thousand meters altitude, and it is this region that contains a large amount of uh, a large number of glaciers of glacial lakes of snow of permafrost that um, and the frozen water becomes a sort a major source of water in the rivers during the dry season providing drinking water water for agriculture for hydropower with changing climates the temperature in the high mountain areas has been growing more rapidly than it has at lower altitudes uh, resulting in a fairly rapid melting of uh, glaciers of snowfields across the region over the past few decades, and this is projected to continue. If if global emissions continue along their current project uh, pro current trajectories, we're expecting to lose two thirds of the glaciers of the Hindu Kush Himalaya by the end of the century. But even if global average temperatures are stabilized at one point five degrees, which is a very a very ambitious target, the high mountain Asia region will still warm to higher temperatures than that and will lose at least a third of its glacial mass. The loss of frozen water in the high mountains of Asia has a lot of downstream consequences. It affects primarily during the dry season the amount of water available in the rivers, which has impact on agriculture and drinking water supply as well as in hydropower. Retreating glaciers also leave behind growing um, glacial lakes and um, there's an expectation of perhaps more glacial lake outburst floods happening in the coming decades, where entire glacial lakes break out of their moraines and run down the rivers, uh, flooding everything along the riverbanks, uh, taking out a lot of infrastructure built along the rivers, including hydropower and roads. And in a lot of ways, we're stuck with climate change in the mountains with the, with the loss of the glaciers, uh, well, of a substantial part of the glaciers and with the loss of our dry season water availability. And what we really only can do is adapt to the changes. We need to make sure that the most vulnerable are kept out of harm's way. And we need to make sure that our infrastructure is built in ways that allows allows it to survive um, glacier uh, caused disasters, that it's that it survives, that also that we get by on less water stored in high mountain areas. But that's all a very narrow picture. The broader picture actually connects the loss of snow and ice from the high mountains with much larger changes taking place in the region. In many ways, the loss of snow and ice from the high mountains is just, it's a, it's a symptom and it's a symbol of a larger issue that is wrong in the region. The problem is that uh, the atmospheric changes that people are driving, are, they're, they're, they lead to a, a, f a larger number of interconnected issues. The same drivers that are driving the increase in temperatures at the high altitudes are also um, causing significant air pollution, the same human activities are causing significant air pollution, and also driving broader climatic changes, such as changes in the monsoon. And, and overall, those probably have much further reaching consequences than just the loss of snow and ice in the mountain areas. The melting of the snow and ice in the high mountain areas is being driven both by the global increase in greenhouse gases, but also by short-lived climate pollutants, particularly black carbon and other dark uh, uh, sunlight absorbing particles that heat up the air and that when they settle on white uh, snowy surfaces will end up um, 
increasing the, the melting rates of those. These are also responsible some of the, for some of the worst air pollution in the world. The countries surrounding high mountain Asia together account for a large fraction of the annual deaths due to air pollution, as well as to um, hundreds of millions of people living under severe air pollution problems. At the same time, the atmospheric changes driven by greenhouse gases and especially by air pollutants in the region as well, um, they lead to changes in the monsoon. They lead to changes in when and how clouds form and also the microphysics of clouds. Um, the presence of fine smoke particles in the clouds changes the droplet size distribution and therefore it changes when and how much rainfall you're going to get and is most likely responsible for delayed onset of rainfall but then heavier rainfalls. Moving around when and how much monsoon rain falls has major impacts on agriculture as well as on disasters, on, on floods, on landslides. Addressing these issues really requires not just to focus on what melts the glaciers of the high mountain areas, but also, but more generally on the anthropogenic combustion activities that are responsible for bad air pollution, for changing the local and regional climate. Globally, we know that the only way to reach a 1.5 degree climate uh, stable, uh, the only way to reach is climate stabilizes 1.5 degrees is by reducing not just the emissions of long-lived greenhouse gases, but also of short-lived climate pollutants, such as black carbon and methane. And addressing the short-lived climate pollutants as well as the greenhouse gases by switching away from fossil fuel combustion, by moving towards, by reducing combustion activities is really the only way to address all of these issues together. Recent assessment report um, concluded that scaling up 25 fairly well-known um, measures to reduce air pollution in Asia would actually have a major impact, not just in global climate, but also on people, a major impact on air pollution and on what people breathe. Uh, these range from, remove, uh, from improving emission standards of vehicles, switching to more electric vehicles, reducing emissions from, from shipping, from, but also from brick constru uh, switching to cleaner brick constru uh, brick making, switching to improved refrigerants, uh, switching people to cleaning cooking with clean fuels, reducing open fires, agricultural fires, improved forest management, reducing forest fires, improved um, solid waste management, all measures that are fairly logical that have a lo lot of local benefits that are generally fairly easy to introduce would together help clean up the air quality for a large fraction of the population in Asia, while also reducing emissions of substances that then affect the monsoon, that affect the cryosphere. What really is needed is not just a, an emphasis on reducing melting in the high mountains, but an integrated approach where perhaps the loss of the, the wide surfaces in the high mountains could be a rallying cry for larger changes.